All right, let's go ahead and get started with today's lecture on deep generative models. Um, so congrats on making it through the class so far. This is our last lecture where we're going to be introducing new content. Um, but just a reminder, nothing we're going to talk about today is on the final exam, so this is just for uh, your own enrichment. Um, so yeah, generative models, really cool. One of my favorite topics in machine learning. Um, this is personally what most of my research is on, so a uh, very cool topic. Okay, uh, just some reminders. Uh, sample final is out on the Canvas page now, uh, and I just put out solutions earlier today. Uh, so check those out. Uh, make sure you study that sample final for the actual final exam. And the discussion section tomorrow is gonna be going over that sample exam and uh, also doing a final review. So this is a good idea to go ahead and solve that sample final before you attend the discussion so you have uh, you know, uh, at least attempted it and are prepared with questions. And the fifth homework is due on Friday. Uh, again, short assignment, I've said this a few times now. And also the projects are due on Monday. Uh, do submit the projects via Gradescope. There is a, an assignment up on Gradescope now for this. Only one student per group actually needs to submit these, uh, so it makes your lives a little bit easier. But when you do go ahead and submit it on Gradescope, make sure you add your group members uh, on Gradescope. It's pretty easy to do this. There's a, a button you can click that will add your group members. Um, so uh, yeah, be sure to submit those on time. Okay, so in today's lecture, we're going to introduce this concept of a generative model. And then we're gonna three, see uh, three different examples of uh, classes of generative models. So we're gonna see these things called autoregressive models, and then things called GANs, and then lastly, we're gonna introduce diffusion models. So today's lecture is gonna be really high level. Uh, generative models are typically fairly math heavy, and uh, we certainly don't have enough time in one lecture to really go through the details of, of how these are working. Um, so the idea is just to get a really high level intuition for how these things are working. Okay, so what is a generative model? Why do we care about these? Well, the main goal of generative modeling is really to do unsupervised learning. But we're not gonna do unsupervised learning in the way that we've seen it before, doing say clustering or dimensionality reduction, because those approaches really don't scale to high dimensional data. So things like audio, images, video, and text, well, it doesn't really make sense to cluster these things because it doesn't really give us all that much insight typically. And clustering is really kind of a limited uh, sort of task at, at the end of the day. And so the main idea behind generative models is that we're gonna try and somehow build a model, build some kind of machine learning algorithm that actually lets us create new data. It's gonna let us sample from the data distribution. So there's this really famous quote from uh, Richard Feynman that says, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And the idea being that if I can build some model that actually can create data that looks like my original data, well, I've kind of learned everything there is to know about that data distribution. So if I can generate synthetic images of, say, people's faces or something like that, well, then I've really learned what it means for uh, an image to be a face. And then we can leverage these generative models to do all kinds of really interesting downstream tasks. And we'll see lots of examples of this in just a second. But the thing to keep in mind here is that, again, the data is almost always unsupervised in these problems. So we just have some large collection of, say, images, and then we'd like to build a model that can actually generate new images. Okay, so let's look at lots of examples to get started. Um, the first is just unconditional image generation. And what I mean by unconditional image generation is that my model is just producing new images every time I query it. So the four faces you see here on this slide are actually not real people. These are images that come from a deep generative model. So a big neural network was trained on a data set of thousands and thousands of faces, and then when you query this model, it's actually able to generate new images of faces. So you can go on this link here, thispersondoesnotexist.com, and it'll actually generate these for you every time you refresh the page. So just looking at these, this is pretty cool, right? We can actually design an algorithm that you know, generates people's faces. Okay, why would you wanna do this? Why is this useful? Well, imagine you're trying to say, you know, create a 3D avatar of someone to use in virtual reality. Um, well, you could use this to actually say, generate someone's maybe profile picture or something like that. And we'll also see ways that you can leverage this to do sort of more interesting things than just generating people's faces. But again, kind of amazing that we can actually generate these very photorealistic images in the first place. Okay, so another thing you can do uh, beyond unconditional image generation is conditional image generation, where you give the model some kind of context, some kind of side information, 
And the goal of the model is to leverage this side information and incorporate it in the things that it generates. So uh, there's these really cool class of models called text to image models, where you give your model, you give your algorithm some string of text, and that text really serves as like a caption for an image. And the model will take this caption and will generate an image or maybe a series of images that actually matches the caption that you give it. So there's this model called Dolly 2. Uh, you can actually log on and play with this yourself. Uh, it's from OpenAI. And what I did is I went on to their API and I typed in the prompt, an oil painting of a cat wearing a wizard hat, and it went ahead and generated these images for me. So again, these are text to image models where you pass in a prompt and it's gonna generate something matching that. Um, again, I just think these are so cool, I can never paint this well. So it's amazing that I can train a model that can actually do this for me. Okay, these things have gotten really good in the last six months, one year. So there's a model called Midjourney. Uh, this is another text to image model. Um, I stole these prompts off the internet, so I don't actually have a prompt going with these. But it's something like, uh, if bears were cool and didn't try to eat hikers. So again, I think these are totally amazing. Um, this pretty almost photorealistic image on the left of a hiker with a bear, uh, clearly totally generated though and not real. Um, okay, another example of a text to image model, uh, again using Midjourney is uh, what if Harry Potter characters were made in a Pixar movie rather than you know, a real life movie? So we've got Harry in the left, uh, Hermione up here, Hagrid and Ron. And again, just totally mind blowing that I can generate these with a click of a button. Um, I imagine in maybe five years, 10 years, you'll see a feature length animated movie generated entirely by AI. So uh, we might be putting the animators out of business uh, soon. Okay, rather than doing text to image models, where you give a text prompt and the image, or rather the model tries to generate an image, you might also condition your generation on another image. So this is like an image to image model. And one thing you can do with this is something like super resolution. So maybe you have uh, some camera, it's a really awful camera, it takes really blurry pictures. So maybe my model uh, at generation time, I, I give it this really blurry picture of a kid's face and my generative model, what I'd like it to, to do, is I'd like to, to take in this blurry image and generate a corresponding high resolution image. This is a super resolution problem. And this image in the middle actually was generated by an AI model, a machine learning model. And so you can see it looks pretty close to the actual reference image. Okay, we use generative models for these types of problems because again, they really learn what the data distribution looks like. They know what faces look like in general so if you give it a blurry version of a face, it can kind of leverage its information, can leverage its knowledge about the unconditional distribution of our faces in order to do this de-blurring procedure. Um, and again, these models have really blown up in the last like six months, one year or so. Uh, this, this paper down here that this figure is from is, is really, really recent. Okay, you can also do things like style transfer as an image to image task, where I'm given a painting on the left I'm given some uh, sort of style painting. This is Starry Night in the middle. My goal is to take the painting on the left uh, and kind of recreate that painting, but in the style of Starry Night. And this is another example of an image to image model where your model uh, takes in some images as kind of a reference or input and generates a new image using these as its context. Um, so again, we can use these for kind of creative purposes as well. Okay, there's also text to video models, so I'm gonna play a video for this one. Let's see, yeah. So this is a very recent paper, came out uh, just this year. But rather than doing text to images like we've seen before, uh, people are now starting to do text to video. So for example, uh, this creepy looking sloth is, uh, we gave it the text prompt, a sloth playing video games and beating all the high scores, and it generates like an actual short video of a fairly realistic looking sloth here. We've got, uh, say, a cat wearing sunglasses and working at a lifeguard in a pool, and, you know, fairly realistic. Uh, these video models still clearly need a bit of work before they're ready to be uh, deployed and, uh, you know, fooling your dad into thinking that these are real videos. But uh, really progress on these has picked up in the last six months or one year or so. Okay, and then we've got another video here. Um, this time it is not a text to image model, uh, we're, we're going beyond the image and video modality, but now we're going to the audio modality. So here this is an audio to audio problem where I'm going to take in some audio 
in this case, uh, hey there, Delilah. And my model is trained to take in the audio and then generate new audio in the style of Kanye West's voice. So let's see if you can hear this. We won't listen to the whole thing, don't worry. Pretty good, right? Um, so yeah, this thing is totally amazing. Yeah, and I give it maybe six months before you hear a song on the radio that's totally AI generated. Um, apparently there are already songs on the radio that are AI generated. Yeah, I have seen the Drake AI one. It's pretty good. <clears throat> okay, so these things also can be applied to more modalities than just images and video and uh, audio. Um, so one example that's really popular is uh, generative modeling for, uh, say, uh, molecular uh, problems. So for instance, you might be given a graph corresponding to a molecule, i.e. Uh, some atoms and which atoms are bonded to these other atoms. It's actually a really hard problem in chemistry to take that graph, that structure, and predict what's sort of the 3D shape of that molecule. How are those atoms actually arranged in space? It's actually a really difficult problem. So recently people have been interested in building generative models that take in a graph as conditioning information and then spit out that actual 3D structure. People also have been applying generative models to things like 3D modeling, where you might want to generate some kind of point cloud representing a 3D shape. So really, this idea of generative modeling, of sampling from your data distribution, creating new data, is really widely applicable to almost any type of data that you can imagine. OK, so any questions on what the point of generative modeling is as a whole, any of the examples we showed so far? Otherwise, we'll get into some examples of models. Yeah. Yeah, so um, really the biggest and best generative models are image models nowadays because you need tons and tons of data to train these things. And so there's plenty of image data available on the internet, but not so much audio data available. So things like text-to-speech models are pretty good, where you can type in text and have generate someone speaking that uh, because you know there's a fair amount of speech data on the internet. But things for like sound effects, you know, we don't just don't have enough data to train these things quite yet. So one of the big open questions in this area of generative modeling is like, how do you train these with small data sets? Um, these, these really impressive examples I'm showing you, like these image to image models are trained on like hundreds of gigabytes of images. So really massive scale is needed to get these to, to work well. Okay, so before we jump into talking about uh, these three kind of specific model classes that I introduced earlier, uh, let's start with just some preliminaries and some notation. So in today's lecture, we're going to focus entirely on the problem of generating images. But basically, everything I say here today can be generalized to audio and uh, molecules and whatever you like. But we're going to focus on images just to keep things simple. So I'm going to use a bold X to indicate uh, an image. And it's going to be an RGB image, so it's going to have three channels. And it's going to have H pixels and W pixels uh, wide. So it's some image, some collection of pixels. I'm going to use x sub i to indicate the ith pixel in my image. And typically, I order my pixels from top left in my image to bottom right. So I just fix some ordering of the, the pixels that I have. x sub i is actually going to be just a three-dimensional vector. It's going to be an r uh, red value, a green value, and a blue value. We often represent images in this way using integers between 0 and 255. Um, so this is just how we typically encode an image uh, in, in your computer. Okay, there's really kind of two broad classes of generative models. Um, the first are what I'm going to call explicit generative models. And the way that these models work is that they learn to assign a probability p of x to every possible image. So if you give me an image and I have an explicit generative model, I can return some number to you uh, telling you how likely that image is 
under the data that it was trained on. So you know, if I uh, say have a face generative model, I'm trained on a data set of images of people's faces. You give me a face, I should assign it high probability. If you give me a picture of a cat, it should assign it low probability because it wasn't in the training data. So it just tells you kind of how likely a particular input x is. And what you can do once you have this probability distribution, p of x, is you actually sample from it. So just like how you could sample from like a, a Gaussian or a normal distribution, if you have an explicit generative model, you can then sample from it to generate new data. The pros of using an explicit generative model is that you can often use this probability to do kind of interesting downstream tasks. Uh, so like I said, we can sample from it. We can also use this probability distribution to assess kind of how realistic an image is. So maybe you wanna do outlier detection or something like that. Uh, well, if you give me an image and it's low probability, then it might be an outlier. It's not something I saw in my data set. So we can do lots of useful things with these beyond just generation. But a con of these explicit generative models is that they often lead to less flexible parameterizations. So uh, a little bit constrained when we use an explicit model. In contrast, there's these things called implicit generative models. And rather than assigning probabilities to particular data points, they're just gonna ge um, directly generate our data somehow. They just don't have a model of the probability. So these are usually a little bit more flexible, but we don't have that, that nice probability distribution anymore. Okay, typically to train one of these deep generative models, what we do is we just train the models to maximize the log likelihood, i.e. the log probability for real images. So I get a big data set of images, say, I pass them through my model and my model assigns them some probability. It's gonna be random numbers at the start when I initialize my model, but using backprop and gradient descent, just like we saw for a multi-layer perceptron or CNNs, I can actually go ahead and try and maximize the probability my model assigns to these images. So this is a procedure called maximum likelihood. It has really nice uh, sort of foundations and statistics. Um, you might have seen this term before in a previous class on stats. But really this idea of maximum likelihood is how almost all generative models are trained. Again, the idea being that we wanna make a high probability for images that our model actually sees during training. In contrast, implicit models, like we said, don't assign probabilities to images. And the way we train these is actually gonna depend highly on the model. For example, GANs, which we're gonna see in a little bit, use this thing called adversarial training. Okay, so let's see our first example of a deep generative model. These are called autoregressive models. Okay, so autoregressive models are explicit deep generative models. And again, we need to figure out some kind of way of taking in an image and returning a probability. And the way we're gonna do that is using the chain rule of probability, where the probability for an image X is going to be equal to the probability of the first pixel times the probability of the second pixel given the first pixel, and then times the probability of my third pixel given the first two, and so on and so forth. So these are autoregressive in the sense that to assign a probability to an entire image, I just need to assign a probability to each individual pixel in my image and then multiply them all together. This equality here always holds. I can always write down this as a true statement uh, just by you know, sort of laws of probability. This is a really similar idea to how language models work like ChatGPT, where rather than predicting one word at a time like we did with a language model, we're gonna be predicting one pixel at a time. But same exact idea. ChatGPT is actually a, a language generative model. Okay, so to illustrate, uh, to do generation with these models, essentially what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna randomly initialize my image. I'll generate my first pixel uh, just from my model. And then to generate my second pixel, my model takes in the first pixel as kind of context, what it's already generated, and then it'll generate a new pixel. And then to generate the third pixel, it'll take in the first two that it generated already, spit out a third pixel, and so on and so forth. So one by one, we're generating every pixel in an image. So to do this, we actually need some kind of model, some kind of neural network that's gonna take in uh, a pixel, x sub i, and some previous pixels, some context, and it needs to return a probability distribution over the next pixel values. So you know, what, what pixels are likely to follow based on the pixels I've already seen? You should really think about this kind of like a classification task. 
there's only kind of a finite number of pixels that can follow uh, the pixels we've already seen because they need to be integers between 0 and 255. So it's like a 255 dimensional classification task almost. What that means is we can train these models in exactly the same way we would train you know, our normal classification models, just using cross entropy or this idea of maximum likelihood. But to actually do this in practice, we need to write down a neural network that's you know, gonna be suitable for this kind of task. And so what we can do is just adapt our favorite model for image classification, uh, convolutional neural networks. So I've got an image of a CNN here. Uh, we went through the details a while ago, and so we'll kind of gloss over it here. Okay, but there's a slight problem with using a CNN. If you remember how CNNs work, we have these filters in a CNN that we scan over the entire image, kind of look locally at each patch of this image. But in an autoregressive model, well, we kind of only have the, um, the pixels that have already been generated. So we only have kind of previous pixels in our image. So if we try to use a convolutional filter, well, it's gonna kind of cheat almost. It's gonna look at pixels that haven't been generated yet. And so we need to use this idea called masking, where we take our filters in our CNN and we just set most of the values to be zero. So for example, if our model only looks at the previous, say, uh, 12 pixels that were generated when it's looking to generate a new image, well, I'm gonna mask out uh, everything except for the first 12 values in my filter. So we're making our CNN kind of only look at the pixels that have already been generated. Okay, and that's kind of all there is to autoregressive models. Again, generating pixels one pixel at a time. Okay, let's quickly look at some code just to make things a little more concrete. In particular, we're gonna look at sampling from these models. So the first step here in this line, is we're gonna create a new image that's just zero for every single pixel value. So I'm just initializing kind of a blank empty image here. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna loop over every single pixel in my image. So that's what these nested for loops are. It's just me looping over every single possible pixel. If I have a trained model, all I need to do is I just need to forward pass with my model, i.e. I need to just take uh, my model, which is uh, self, and do dot forward, and then I'm gonna pass in the image. So what I'm doing is I'm taking in all the pixels that I've already generated, putting them into my model. My model returns a distribution over what pixel should be happening next. And then I actually sample from this distribution over pixels to get my next pixel. So all in all, not too bad to generate, or to, to implement these, maybe like 15 lines of code. I think it's one pixel at a time. Okay, so let's see an example of what you can do with an autoregressive model. Um, here we've got a collection of very scary looking uh, faces generated from a model called Pixel CNN. This was way back in 2016, uh, so quite a while ago. Uh, but at the time, this was the best performing deep generative model that we really had. And you know, back in 2016, this was pretty impressive. We could actually generate fairly high resolution faces, and you can tell that they are actually kind of faces. Um, and you know, clearly based on the examples I showed at the very start, we've come a long way since, since 2016. Okay, so the strengths of using these autoregressive models is that it's a fairly simple concept, again, one pixel at a time. And they are an explicit likelihood model, so we do get those probabilities that are useful. And they're relatively easy to implement these things. But one of the cons of using these classes of models is that they're slow to generate from. Because we need to generate one pixel at a time, it requires forward passing with our model multiple times. So if you wanna generate an image that's 1,000 pixels high and 1,000 pixels wide, well, that's gonna uh, require about a million evaluations of your neural network to generate a single image. So you'll be quite slow to do that. And empirically, these models just typically perform worse than newer model classes. So these autoregressive models have kind of uh, fallen out of favor recently. There's lots and lots of specific examples of these autoregressive models that we haven't gone into the details of, but they all seem uh, follow the same kind of basic concept here. Okay, so any questions on autoregressive models? Yeah. Yeah, so for the first few pixels, generally they can take in a variable number of pixels to uh, kind of use as their context. So for the first pixel it generates, it takes a no context. It's just gonna sample kind of a random starting pixel. 
but it's not totally random. It's like, what is the distribution over starting pixels in all of my training data? So maybe all of my, if I have MNIST digits, for example, well, all of my images have black pixels in the top left, it'll generate a black pixel because that's what it's seen. Um, but eventually it generates enough to take it in context as it, as it goes, yeah. Okay, cool. Let's see another class of models called GANs. And again, we're just gonna go really high level uh, through, through how these work and give you some intuition. So GANs are short for Generative Adversarial Networks. And uh, before we jump into how these work, uh, just a reminder that neural networks for classification, the kind of picture you should have in mind is well, we might have some image of a car, X. We pass it through our neural network, we do that evaluation. And our neural network outputs a vector of probabilities uh, corresponding essentially to the prediction of what is in this image. What we're gonna do in a GAN is we're gonna take this setup from image to classification, kind of flip it on its head. What we're gonna do instead is that rather than passing an image into our neural network to do generation, what we're gonna do is we're gonna first sample a random input vector. So we're gonna sample some random noise as the input to our model. We take this random noise, pass it through our network to get a prediction, and the output of our network is actually just gonna be an entire image. So GANs in kind of one shot, sample noise and generate a whole image in one forward pass. Okay, the way these work is that we actually have two neural networks in a GAN. The first is our generator network, which again, takes in random noise and is gonna try to generate a fake image just doing some computations on this noise. We're skipping over the details of how this generator works, but just think it's a big neural network that's doing some, some black magic on the inside. What we do to train these things is that we also have a training set of real images. So my model is generating fake images and I've got real images that I can kind of compare to. What I do is I train a second neural network called a discriminator network here in red. And this discriminator network, what it does is it takes in fake images and it also takes in real images, and it tries to classify these images as whether or not they were real or whether or not they were generated. So again, two neural networks, a generator and a discriminator. And the idea is that we're going to train these networks simultaneously in an adversarial fashion. The goal of the generator is to try to generate images that can fool the discriminator. So if I have a really good discriminator, a really good classifier that can tell me if something is real or fake, well, my generator wants to be able to you know, trick this classifier by producing images that look like real images, which again is our goal in generative modeling. The discriminator, of course, needs to somehow try and catch this generator. It needs to be able to pick up on which images are real and which are fake. And so really this leads to something you can see as a two-player game. So our two players are our two networks and they're kind of pitted against each other, trying to beat each other at this uh, kind of real or fake task. Oftentimes, GANs are actually analyzed via game theory techniques. Uh, so there's lots of cool stuff happening in the background for, for GANs. Um, I'll point out here that these models are actually fairly old, um, at least uh, by machine learning standards. So these were introduced way back in 2014. And for a very long time, GANs were kind of the king of generative models. Uh, in fact, recently until about, you know, 2020, 2021, uh, really state-of-the-art generative models were based on this GAN idea. Okay, let's see how these models are trained in code. Again, really high level, uh, going through this fairly quickly. The first step is that my generator is gonna produce a fake image. So it takes in some random noise, I pass it through the network, and the generator produces some output. When I first initialize these models, well, my output's not gonna look like a real image at all, it's just gonna be you know, some, some blob of pixels. But my generator does its best and tries to produce a fake image. I also take a real image from my training data, so I, I look at an actual image, and I pass this through my discriminator model. So my discriminator makes a prediction on whether or not the real image I gave it was real or fake. Okay, and then it does the same thing except rather than taking in a real image from my training data, I'm gonna take in the generated image. So my discriminator looks at both the fake image and the real image. Okay, to train my discriminator, 
I'm just going to do the usual classification thing. So I essentially have a made up classification problem, right? I know which of my images is real and which of them is fake. So I've got a binary classification problem. And I can train my discriminator just using this cross entropy loss. For the generator, what I'm going to do is kind of the opposite of this. The loss for the generator is going to be the cross entropy measuring essentially how well the discriminator classified the fake images. Or in other words, my generator is going to pay a high penalty. It's going to have a high loss if the discriminator is really good at telling which images are fake and which images are real. So again, we've got this two-player game going on kind of simultaneously. The discriminator is trying to detect real versus fake. So that's what's going on here. And the generator is trying to fool the discriminator by generating realistic looking images. These two models are trained simultaneously with one another because we need to sort of uh, almost bootstrap the uh, discriminator in the sense that if we have a discriminator that's way too good at the start, well, our generator is never going to be able to fool it and it's never going to learn how to generate real images. Okay, so not too bad to train these. Again, only maybe 10, 15 lines of code. Okay, so here's uh, what I'll play on the next slide is an animation uh, showing you what happens as we train GANs for longer and longer. So at the start, what you'll see is our GAN is really bad at generating images. It just generates basically pure noise. But then after training this model for many, many iterations, it'll eventually generate some realistic looking uh, MNIST digits. So eventually over time, again, it learns to generate realistic looking things. So uh, even though I said GANs were kind of dethroned in 2020 and 2021, uh, they've made a bit of a comeback uh, recently in uh, 2023, a uh, month or two ago, uh, with this model called GigaGAN. So this GigaGAN model actually is a 1 billion parameter GAN model for text to image uh, classification, or rather generation. And again, these are massive data sets that these are trained on with huge numbers of parameters. Um, this model probably costs like on the order of a, a million dollars to train. Okay, we're skipping lots of details on how you actually would train a model like GigaGAN, but it's the same basic concept. We have a generator network and a discriminator network kind of playing against one another. This is a text to image model, and you can see it does pretty, pretty cool things, uh, like a cube made of denim on a wooden table. Um, I guess this is just to highlight that these things can actually generate things it didn't see during training. They can actually kind of generalize. Uh, I assume there's no photos out there of a cube made of denim. Um, so pretty cool that these things can actually kind of stitch together concepts it learns uh, and doesn't kind of just regurgitate its training data. Okay, so the pros of GANs as a generative model is that they're really fast to sample from. So all you need to do is sample random noise and then pass it through your neural network, which only requires one model evaluation. So pretty cheap. If you compare that to something like an autoregressive model that requires like a million model evaluations, you know, this is basically nothing. And empirically, these models often produce very high quality samples. So uh, they're really nice because they actually work in practice. But in terms of cons, these models actually are quite difficult to train. Uh, they're often unstable in the sense that your loss, because it is an adversarial loss, uh, kind of blows up and these things can be very unwieldy to work with. And they're also implicit models. We never wrote down a probability distribution for images at any point in time. Uh, we're just you know, sort of one shot generating images. Okay, so questions on GANs. Right, yeah, so um, we haven't talked about how to condition these models. Um, really, everything here today is this unconditional setting where it's just is generating a new image from the distribution. We're not conditioning it on any kind of text. Typically, the way these things are conditioned on text is that rather than just passing in random noise into your network, you also pass in the text into your generator network. 
It's not the raw text that you pass in, it's often an embedding of that text. So if you remember back to the NLP lecture, we, we take that text, turn it into a vector, that vector gets stuck into the network somehow. And then it's just trained basically in the same way as, as this, except the model's also taking in the text. There are more uh, advanced ways of doing this uh, text conditioning, uh, different ways of training them, but kind of beyond the scope of today's lecture, yeah. So I believe what happens is that, so, so in your training set, you have images and captions with them together. And so um, you essentially have image caption pairs. Your generator model, uh, if you have a caption, you can take in random noise, it'll generate an image, and then you can kind of pair that with the caption. Also, that random noise, uh, the, the caption is going through the generator at the same time. So the generator is trying to generate an image that matches the, the given caption which is essentially the same kind of data we have in the training data set, right? We have image caption pairs. But it is trying to generate images that, that match those captions, even though it is just pure random noise. And then we use, um, it's typically not exactly the same loss here, it's a loss that takes into account how well the captions match the images as well, typically by looking at those embedding vectors um, in some kind of geometric way. Um, I don't have all the details here, but, um, you know, same idea, also text embeddings that we look at to compare, yeah. Cool, other game questions? Yeah. Um, no, so your caption is just some string of text, which for the sake of uh, the models is just turned into some feature vector. So it's embedded as some, some vector representing that caption. And oftentimes these things are trained such that the embeddings of the words actually uh, sort of are reflective of the content in the images, kind of like how pure word embeddings uh, kind of reflect relationships between words. You can do word embeddings plus images that kind of try to reflect in a geometric way the content of the images. So, you know, it's not like, it's not like every word here gets um, some kind of embedding and they get combined together. They're actually embedding these full sentences um, to try and represent the images. But yeah, the way you do text to image models is quite a bit more complex than what we'll have time to cover, yeah. And then lastly, let's uh, very, very high level see the idea behind a diffusion model. So as I mentioned, these GAN models were really dethroned in 2020, 2021, and along came diffusion models. Uh, these models, I think, are really, really cool. And in fact, uh, most of my research is on diffusion models, so um, I know these pretty well. And the basic idea, the quote to keep in mind for a diffusion model, is that creating noise from data is easy, but creating data from noise is generative modeling. So with again, we saw how to create data from noise, just passing it through a network. But now we're gonna leverage kind of the reverse of this procedure to build a thing called a diffusion model. So the basic idea behind a diffusion model is that we're gonna take an image and we're gonna slowly corrupt this image with noise, i.e. random pixel values. So maybe I've got a picture of a cat here coming from my training distribution and in one time step, I'm gonna add a little bit of random noise to this image. So I make it a little bit noisier with just random pixel values. I do this for a second step, it becomes even noisier, a third step, even noisier, so on and so forth. If I do this for very many steps, what happens is I turn my data just into pure noise. Okay, this is the first half of the quote here, creating noise from data is easy. I just slowly add random pixels to my image. And the idea behind a diffusion model is, what if we could learn to reverse this procedure? I.e., I start with just pure random noise, 
And slowly by slowly, I learned to remove noise from this image. So that's starting from the right-hand side of this picture, I sample just pure random pixel values. And maybe I remove a little bit of noise from this and it kind of starts to resemble a cat. Okay, remove a little bit more noise, it's more cat-like, so on and so forth, until eventually I manage to generate something that actually looks like an original image. Okay, and this is the basic idea behind a diffusion model. We have this forward process that turns data into noise, and we specify this by hand. So we actually know how to do this. It's very easy. We just add random values, and we learn to undo this procedure. These diffusion models are often sometimes called denoising models because that's exactly what they're doing. They're removing noise from images. Okay, these models are great because it takes about four lines of code to implement training for this. Uh, that is, once you have your model uh, actually written down and implemented. So all you do is you get a data point from your training data. So pick a random image in your training set. Sample some random noise. So this is just uh, uh, essentially an image at the same dimensionality of your input image. But the pixel values are just totally random. So I'm just drawing some random noise here. This equation here says I'm going to take my original image and create a noisy version of that image by just adding in this noise. So I'm corrupting my data point a little bit. Then all I do is I take the noisy version of my image and I stick it into my neural network model, which here is called epsilon sub theta. So epsilon sub theta is a neural network. And what this neural network tries to do is it takes in this noisy image, underlined in orange, and it tries to predict the noise, epsilon, that was added to my original image to create the noisy version. That is, it's performing denoising. Again, it takes in a noisy image, it tries to learn the noise that was added to remove that noise. And here we're kind of measuring how good our model is doing by just looking at the norm, i.e. the size of the vector, between the true noise epsilon and the predicted noise epsilon sub theta. Okay, that's all you need to do to train a diffusion model. Four lines of code. Again, predicting noise that was added to an image. Sampling these models is also relatively simple, um, but the details of what's really going on here are uh, far beyond the scope of this course. Um, just so you've heard these words before, really what's going on here is a procedure called Langevin dynamics. Um, it really arises from physics and these things called stochastic differential equations. Uh, really, really cool, but definitely uh, too much for this course. But the basic idea here is that to start out with, we're gonna sample pure noise. So we sample an image, we create an image where every pixel value is random. Then over a large number of time steps, uh, that's this for loop, we're gonna slowly remove noise from this pure noise image uh, over this large number of time steps. So that's what this equality here is doing. We're, we're actually removing the noise. Where again, here we use our network. Uh, let me back up. Uh, epsilon sub theta is our neural network. It's taking in the noisy version of the image at the current time step and predicting how to remove the noise from that image. So it's slowly removing noise over time. And again, we can really implement this in, what, four or five lines of code. Okay, graphically, what's going on is I have some neural network, which is this big uh, purple and orange box. Again, it's taking in a noisy image, this kind of noisy cat picture, and it's predicting the noise that was added to this cat picture to produce the, the noisy version of this. So again, it's learning to remove noise. Okay, in the next slide, I have an animation kind of showing you over time what these models are doing. So again, idea, sample random noise, and slowly remove it. Okay, so random noise, start out with, and slowly, slowly over time, we remove noise little bit by little bit. Uh, I wish it would pause when we get to the last images, but okay, yeah, you can see the, you can see the idea. Uh, so yeah, really cool, these models, uh, uh, what they're doing. Okay, so there's a bit of a controversial paper that came out in, uh, I think this was 2022, with the title, Diffusion Models Beat GANs on Image Synthesis. So this paper made a really big splash when it came out because this was the first time that GANs really uh, kind of were beaten on this task of image generation. And looking at these images, you know, these are quite realistic photos of various animals that this uh, model was trained on. So we've got like snow leopards and tennis balls and so on and so forth. So diffusion models, again, pros and cons. 
is that really these are the state-of-the-art models for image and video generation nowadays. So things like Dolly 2, uh, Stable Division, uh, Midjourney, um, things you guys might have heard of, a lot of the examples from the first few slides really are all diffusion models. So really these are the, the latest and greatest uh, generative models out there. Again, these are relatively easy to implement compared to something like a GAN. We don't have to do adversarial training. We just do this denoising training, which you know, is maybe eight lines of code to actually implement in total. In terms of cons of these models, they're actually quite complex mathematically in terms of what's going on in the background. Um, to get those eight lines of code, you need to do quite a bit of work. Uh, might be a pro depending on who you ask if you like math, but uh, most people in machine learning just try to avoid it when possible. Another con of these models is that they're very slow to sample from. Uh, it often requires something like thousands of model e uh, evaluations because we need to do this denoising process over very many time steps. They're also semi-implicit models uh, in the sense that you can get a lower bound on the probability, uh, but they don't actually evaluate model probabilities explicitly. Okay, so that's diffusion models in a nutshell. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so you can actually get rid of this additional noise term. Um, you need to do a modification, but you can throw away that noise term. And you get something called a probability flow ODE, which is like a deterministic version of this sampling process. But, um, so technically the forward process is a stochastic differential equation. The reverse of that stochastic differential equation, just running it backwards in time, also needs to be a stochastic differential equation. So you need to actually add noise in the sampling to do the right thing. Um, we can talk more offline, though. Okay, other questions about diffusion models? Yeah. So this noise is um, essentially random pixel values. So um, when we do the sampling, when we want to sample a new image, we'll sample uh, random noise a single time at the start of the generation process. So that's line one of this right here. But actually during the generation process, skipped over the details, you're going to be adding more noise to the images. And so we sample more noise in step three during this for loop. Um, the reason we add that noise is a little bit complicated. Um, so. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's random every time we do a new generation, yeah. No, the input is different every time, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, um, Evaluating these things is actually quite difficult. Um, it's not like classification, like you can't write down an accuracy score and say which of these is better. Um, so oftentimes people, things, or people do things like human evaluations where you generate a bunch of images from these models, pay a bunch of people online to say which of these looks better. Um, so there can be some subjective evaluation stuff going on. There's attempts to do quantitative evaluations of these. And to the best of my knowledge, that GigaGAN model is comparable to diffusion models right now. So they're about on par with one another. However, I will say that you can get away with smaller diffusion models that compare to that GigaGAN model. Uh, so GigaGAN is giga because it's a billion parameter model, which is massive. Um, you do not need a billion parameters for diffusion models. Um, so yeah, depending on what camp you're in, uh, you might argue about which of these models is the state of the art. But it's diffusion models. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and wrap up. Um, so 
Again, really high level idea about generating.